This is my talk on electronic weaponry. I initially titled it uh, "How to Rule the World" by uh, while shopping at Radio Shack. Um, I proved I proved I proved myself wrong on that one. I went to Radio Shack. Um, let's just say they don't sell speakers anymore. So uh, I don't know what else to say. They do have uh, some cool stuff on sale if you want electronics. So, um, so the stuff I'm playing with, uh, high voltage, high current, can kill you. It can also destroy all the electronic stuff that you care about. So if you decide to muck about with it, keep things you care about it shielded or far away. Just saying. And also, FCC really doesn't like you broadcasting on frequencies you're not licensed for. Um, especially high power levels, like taking out cell phones, ambulances, airplanes, they tend to come to your house. <laughs> and like, I think the minimum fines about 10 grand, not to mention jail time. So, ah, eh, there, there you go. Uh, I'm not good at talking, so y'all are in for a ride. Uh, this is my 10th year at DEF CON. Uh, decided to give something back to y'all, so here I am. Um, who's here for the first year? Anybody? Good. We need more people. Uh, yes, the Riviera is getting full, but we still need more people. So uh, keep coming back. So I'm going to go over what EMP is. It's, this is a pretty basic talk. I was looking mostly to judge interest. I mean, I can go into like far deeper topics, but most people I know are programmers. So this is more aimed at people that don't have hardware knowledge or are getting into hardware knowledge or are wondering what all the hype is about EMP. Uh, there's also a thing called uh, EFI or RFI, which is interference. It's more like a DOS attack. And then we have the cuttings, uh, the cutting edge laser type stuff that the military is using to th do things like shoot drones out of the sky and shoot satellites. And I'm also going to demo a sonic attack. Um, or a, there's a thing called an LRAD. I'll cover it in a little bit. But I basically build a small version of it from a trip to Fry's and Radio Shack. Um, I just want some th there's with up on the screen there's some basic electronic concepts. Um, all conductive material acts as an antenna. That's why EMP matters. Your shielded case is actually will absorb RF and will produce a vo voltage because of that. The more RF or the more EMP power, the higher the voltage. Get to about 100 volts, get to about 10 volts and most ICs stop working. Um, CMOS type things are rated at 3 volts so you put 100 in them and they just go flash in the night. Uh, most communication things run on one or two watts like your cell phone, you know, about two watt transmitter. So if you put anything out bigger than that, you can easily swamp and just take out everybody around you. Uh, the only good way to build an EMP is a nuclear weapon as of right now. There are some other tests that are, it's like a flux, a fl compressed flux explosive, but they're all explosive generated so I'm not demoing that either. <laughs> I don't want to go to jail. Um, Ohm's law is the basic thing you really need to learn. Um, knowing the power levels you're going to be messing with will save your life. It's saved mine a couple of times. Uh, we know all computers run, run on binary signals. It usually means like plus or zero, three point three volts, or you know zero or five volts. When you start sending like two volts, uh, you get into a floating state and makes logic go all haywire. So by injecting a two volt signal, you can make things go really crazy. Um, just a rule for transformers. You will trade current for voltage, which means uh, you see neon sign transmitters are putting out 15,000 volts, you know, off the wall current. They're putting in about 10 milliamps. That's still enough to kill you, but it won't make you catch on fire usually. Uh, RF power diminishes over distance, uh, just like light does. It's a square inverse law. So the farther you are away from the target, the better off or safer you are. Um, I can say I've done things with spark gaps and interrupted cell phone and, and uh, cordless phone a quarter mile from my house. I found this out on accident because my neighbors asked me if I had problems with my, co my phone that day. I also was really close to an EMS station. Yeah, not good. Uh, this is XKCD. I'm sure you've all seen it before. Um, I, I ran across it when I was doing some pictures for the talk. It just basically covers like the, the, vis the, the spectrum of RF. Everything basically is energy. Like matter, all of its energy, it comes down to what frequency you're vibrating at. So 60 hertz to light is all, it's all, it's all RF, it's all EMP based idea. Okay, so uh, RF or electromagnetic interference is usually a DOS type of attack. Um, you're usually not going to damage the thing completely, but you can stop service. 
Um, doing things like, oh, now this theaters, a lot of theaters overseas are using uh, cell phone blockers for top, to stop people from using cell phones in the, in the movies. That's an FCC violation. Um, there is no licensed jammer in the US. You can buy jammers on the internet though. Um, pretty easily. For a while I was actually going to like, you know, list off places you can buy them. Uh, yeah, Google. Okay, so some of the easy ones to build are Spark Gap Transmitter, which is a really, really wide, bane, uh, wide base, uh, wide, wide bandwidth device, and you can buy some other off, uh, off the shelf transmitters. Uh, Spark Gap was the Spark, Spark Gap Transmitter was the first device used to transmit over air. The first, one of the first tests was actually to cross the uh, Atlantic Ocean with a radio signal using Morse code to give you the idea of power levels. In the late 1920s, they were doing RF and they could cross the ocean with it. Now we have a lot of noise in the air but RF still works. You can still use spark gap transmitters, just the FCT doesn't like it because it's not very focused anymore. They're really easy to build. That, that is a basic spark gap transmitter schematic. A battery, a coil, a couple capacitors, a spark gap and an antenna. It'll put out RF like you will not believe. Not demoing that. Uh, off the self transmitter, like I said, I thought about uh, talking about, you know, like you can buy them. Anybody can buy them. I mean, there are China distributors that will ship you things that will block out cell phones and stuff for 50 bucks, 100 dollars. If you get caught with it, yeah, not good. Um, also, ham radios, a lot of them, the reason they sell them to ham radio operators is because they can usually operate on license frequencies that they're not normal for public, like airplanes. You live near an airport, you start keying up those airplane frequencies, the black trucks will show up at your door. They will triangulate on you and be unhappy with you because you can mess with the telemetry. So uh, just to talk about complexity of circuits, this is a pretty simple transmitter. Um, anybody can build this with basically a trip to like DigiKey. You know, on the net, order the parts, put it together and you have a transmitter. Not as high power but it runs on a 1.5 volt battery. So you're not really going for high power at that point. Okay, so EMP. Um, an EMP is an electromagnetic wave, or mag electromagnetic wave with enough power that it can create over voltage situations in wires and traces. What that means is as your wire, as the traces in your uh, device are, using, are acting as a circuit, it will induce enough power, enough voltage, enough current to blow out the pieces, which is basically everything you use nowadays. Um, there's a lot of people that are thinking about like, you know, well, what happens if an EMP is launched or, or fired over the U.S. or what if a nuke is fired over the U.S.? A nuclear bomb is horrid. A nuclear bomb detonated in air over the U.S. is ten times that. Because while a nuclear device would be very localized, like it would take out a city or two or something, an EMP could take out a coast. And all of it would stop. Like all of your trucks, all of your cell phones, all your, everything. Luckily they're kind of hard to do. So as I was saying, um, EMPs, long range, difficult task. All of them require either a large power grid, um, where you probably need to be noticed, or atomic nuclear weapons. A guy named Arinko uh, Fermi was the first guy that came up with it. He was part of the initial uh, atomic bomb testing, and he's the guy that they, uh, he's the reason that we have recorded stuff about those tests because he's the person that pushed to get everything shielded, and that's the reason we still have some of that scientific data now. Even with it, we still had lost a lot. Um, there are reports of EMP type weapons being used that are non-nuclear. Um, it's basically a government only type thing. Popular Science actually did, or it was Popular Mechanics, one of the two, did a little article on it and it was like a blurb about, you know, an EMP that was local and it was still explosive generated but it was like smaller and it didn't use a nuke. Um, there have been reports of it being used in Iraq but nothing confirmed. Uh, it's called a Explosively pumped flux compression generator. Basically you charge up this big coil with a lot of power and then you set off a bomb underneath it that makes it change from like a thousand coil wire, or a thousand wrap coil to a one coil wire. So the magnetic flux just goes, current goes up really fast. Um, like I said, another option is to use a low induction capacitor bank charged into or jumped into a single low, uh, coil antenna. That will also give you a low range EMP type effect. And I mean low range, I mean like around me, not the room. Capacitors are heavy, not shipping them. <laughs> um, why do we care? Like I said before, I mean, how would you feel without your smartphone? I talked to a guy that recently had his, uh, 
his Apple branded phone die on him on the way to a new city that he'd never been to before. So he lost his cell phone, his GPS, all of his directions, you know, all of his phone numbers because we rely on them so much that, and he was in a city that he knew no, he knew no one. And uh, he kind of wandered into a bad part of Houston. Uh, luckily he got out without any scrapes but it was still, uh, it, was, it was very scary for him. Uh, how to protect from RFI and things like that. Basically good shielding using uh, spread, sp spread spectrum frequency hopping will help you avoid it to a point unless somebody's just blasting out a lot. Uh, better data correction of course will help you. But the best thing is just get away from it. That's the same thing with EMP. I mean you can build a Faraday cage and if you have enough power near you it will just go through the Faraday cage like it, it's not even there. So there's some, uh, the other thing I was going to go over really quickly are the uh, projectile based things, rail guns, coil guns are called Gauss guns. Um, really cool, not really what I'm going to talk about too much, I'm just covering them because they are considered electric or electronic weapons. Coil guns basically use a magnetic field to pull a, ma a magnetic projectile down the barrel. Um, using timing and lots of power you can get 22 caliber speeds give or take. They've, some people have beaten that a little bit. Uh, rail guns are much more uh, efficient but they require much more power. So uh, I think it's Texas A&M has a, a rail gun type thing, the military has one that they're working with, there's a couple guys on the internet that have built them or built them. All requires large capacitor banks. Pretty interesting but yeah, it's, it's still a bullet. I mean they're, no, they're, no, no, they're nowhere near the efficiency of just gunpowder yet. Uh, weaponized lasers are coming of age. They're us being used nowadays for everything from blinding people, uh, like targets, like uh, a terrorist will blind them to like stop them from coming, to shooting drones out of the sky. Uh, they've done three or four tests now, I think, with the military's newest uh, weapon tracking system that uses a laser or a directed energy weapon to knock a predator out of the sky. Um, this is a Navy based thing, but the fact that it works is kind of scary. They also have one that can knock out satellites. Um, they did that a couple years ago actually. It got no press of course, but they shot a defunct uh, Air Force satellite out of, the, out of orbit and blew the camera off. So they hit something this big from the ground. I thought that was pretty impressive considering all the atmospheric distortion you have to take up with. Um, the Miracle laser is uh, actually in New Mexico. It's not too far from here. Um, I want to go there one day but I don't think I'll ever make it. So uh, now you've noticed all these devices are pretty power hungry. I'm going to go through some pretty simple, easy to do at home uh, power supplies for them. Um, I'm going to go through really fast on some parts just for the people that don't have electronics experience at all because I think building in the bottom is best. I mean, starting with a good baseline. Uh, we have the resistor. Basically it's a resistive flow of energy, turns it into heat, used in a lot of things pretty much. That's what it looks like. Coils. <coughs> also called inductors. They store energy in a magnetic field. Uh, they can be more efficient than capacitors but are usually more prone to heat damage. Uh, capacitors uh, store energy between two plates. They're the bread and butter of all of the electronic weapons out there nowadays. Short of one laser that's actually a chemical laser powered by a jet engine. Uh, the diode direction current uh, transistors. Uh, basic electronic switches used in amplifiers, things like that. MOSFETs are really powerful or high current uh, abilities for transistors for the most part. And then you have transformers. Uh, uses an oscillating a or AC field to generate current in another one based on the number of coils. Um, it's pretty easy. You can get ignition coils from your local uh, like AutoZone or whoever you buy car stuff from. A lot more parts. <laughs> okay, so here's a Marx generator. Uh, it's one of the more common uses to make spark gaps. You basically, uh, you charge up capacitors and then you discharge them in series. You charge them up in parallel so you have, you know, say a thousand volt capacitor and you have ten of them. And you charge them up, up to a thousand volts each. And when you discharge them, you discharge them in series so you add the capacitor, you add the capacitor's voltage up over however many capacitors you have. So it's really easy to go to, you know, get a thousand volt capacitors off eBay and then produce a hundred thousand volt jump. I mean, it's really simple. This is a voltage multiplier. Um, it's whenever you need high voltage DC. It uses a very similar thing but it uses diodes instead of sparks. And uh, 
I actually meant to bring one.